Hello and welcome. House of Representatives asks federal government to evacuate Nigerians living in Ukraine as Russia attacks the territory. The president identifies power supply as key ingredient of national economic development as he inaugurates projects in Nasarawa state. Former head of state General Yakubu Gowan seeks quality leadership in political offices as a way of eradicating poverty. From London, as Russian forces enter the north, south and east of Ukraine, the EU says Vladimir Putin has brought war back to Europe. And in business news tonight, Brent crude climbs above $100 per barrel, gold hits one-year high and global markets plunge as Russia launches military attack on Ukraine. On sports news tonight, UEFA will move the Champions League final from the Zenit St. Petersburg Stadium due to the escalating situation in Ukraine. And from Abuja, court orders interim forfeiture of former Imo State Governor Rocha Sokoracha's property in Abuja. Russia has launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, destroying the country's infrastructure and killing scores of people. Citizens reported explosions on several targets overnight and woke up to the aftermath. Meanwhile, there are reports attacks there have continued. So here's what we know now. Fighting has been reported on the outskirts of the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, as government forces try to recapture an airbase and airport. Russian troops are engaged in heavy fighting with Ukrainian troops at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The area, we understand, has been retaken by Ukrainian forces. Counting the casualties from the attacks, Ukraine says at least 57 people have been killed and 169 others wounded following Russia's full invasion by land, sea and air in the biggest attack by one state against another in Europe since World War II. And the U.S. President Joe Biden has outlined strong sanctions to maximize the long-term impact on Russia and to minimize the impact on the United States and its allies. He says he's agreed with the G7 leaders from the world's largest economies that they'll collectively limit Russia's ability to do business in dollars, euros, pounds and yen. Explosions rang out in the capital, Kyiv, and other cities as Russia invaded Ukraine. They came after Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, ordered a military operation into Ukraine's east. Russian forces fired missiles at several cities and landed troops on Ukraine's southern coast. Several Ukrainian civilians were reportedly killed. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky declared martial law. He also called on citizens to fight, saying weapons will be issued to everyone who wants them. Ukraine's allies have been quick to condemn Russia's actions and avowed hard-hitting sanctions. Today, in concert with our allies, we will agree a massive package of economic sanctions designed in time to hobble the Russian economy. And to that end, we must also collectively cease the dependence on Russian oil and gas that for too long has given Putin his grip on Western politics. These sanctions are designed to take a heavy toll on the Kremlin's interests and their ability to finance war. And we know that millions of Russians do not want war. President Putin is trying to turn the clock back to the times of the Russian Empire. But in doing so, he is putting at risk the future of the Russian people. I call on Russia to immediately stop the violence and to withdraw its troops from Ukraine's territory. We will not let President Putin tear down the security architecture that has given Europe peace and stability over many decades. We will not allow President Putin 
to replace the rule of law by the rule of force and ruthlessness. Les événements de cette nuit sont un French President Emmanuel Macron says his country will respond without weakness to Russia's act of war against Ukraine. And Russia should expect tough sanctions that would hit its military, its economy and its energy sector. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg says Russia has launched a cold-blooded long-planned invasion. This is a grave moment for the security of uh, Europe. Russia's unjustified and unprovoked attack on, Ukraine's, on Ukraine is putting countless innocent lives at risk. With air and missile attacks, ground forces and special forces from multiple directions, targeting military infrastructure and major urban centers. This is a deliberate, cold-blooded and long-planned invasion. Despite its litany of lies, denials and disinformation, the Kremlin's intentions are clear for the world to see. Russia's leaders bear full responsibility for their reckless actions and the lives lost. Ukrainian state air traffic services has closed the country's airspace. Traffic jams have formed in the capital, Kyiv, as residents try to leave the city. Residents have also sought shelter in stations and queues forming for buses, cash points and petrol. And following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the House of Representatives is calling for the immediate evacuation of Nigerians in the troubled country. The motion was moved by Honorable Ahmed Munir during plenary today, where the lawmakers expressed concern that there are many Nigerian students in Ukraine who could be caught in the crossfire. Some lawmakers fear that it may be too late, as the evacuation should have been done long ago. Our correspondent Terry Ikumi reports. Hours after Russia attacked Ukraine, following the tension of war that has built up in the past weeks, lawmakers and the House of Representatives call for an urgent evacuation of Nigerians in Ukraine, even as some fear that it may be rather too late. Concerned that if a strategic plan is not put in place to secure and provide safe passage for our citizens, they may be trapped or worse, harmed. The President of the United States of America, about four or five days ago, said that he, and he said with certainty, that it was imminent that uh, President Putin would order his forces into Ukraine. That was the period within which we should have used to evacuate our people from that country. We must look for how best to evacuate our citizens who are locked up in Ukraine, especially the students, because their case is very, very, very Unique. The urgency of the situation prompts the House to turn to a man who voluntarily offered to evacuate Nigerians from South Africa during the xenophobic attacks in 2019 and stranded Nigerians from the United Kingdom following the outbreak of COVID-19 in 2020, Alan Onyema. We have somebody in this country that is very humane and is ever ready in this type of situation. Chairman Air Peace we should appeal to him the way he did it before. I think the leader of the House, the Chairman of Foreign Affairs, yes. should, li should liaise with um, the Foreign Affairs Ministry today. With all sense and of And if nothing positive comes out of that meeting, and it's all about red table, we have to mm -hmm. do this, we have to do that, I think you should liaise with the, the Chairman Air Peace. Yes. And uh, whatever it's going to cost the House, whatever we need to do, I think we need to leave this, you need to leave this country latest tomorrow and head um, to Ukraine and head on back by Monday with, our, with as many students who or citizens who are willing to, to come back. As the House considers evacuation of Nigerians, there are concerns about the possibility of that evacuation considering that Ukraine has shot its airspace to civilian flights. Terry Ikumi. Channels Television News. 
Meanwhile, the Nigerian embassy in Ukraine has called for calm and vigilance among residents in the country there. In a travel advisory by the embassy, the mission urges Nigerians to be proactive with their personal safety. It, however, adds that citizens who may be uncomfortable with the development can relocate to safer places of their choice, but must ensure they validate their residency documents for ease of return. For students seeking temporary relocation, the embassy advised them to seek proper clearance and guarantee from their institutions. And as concerns heighten over the safety of Nigerians in Ukraine, the federal government says it's planning their evacuation to get them out of danger once the country's airports are open. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyama, told Channels Television in his office in Abuja that the government wants the adoption of a highly tactical approach to ensure that the conflict does not become bigger. Our first priority uh, is to the Nigerian citizens uh, that find themselves in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, we've been engaging uh, over the last three weeks uh, with our embassy in the Ukraine and I've been personally in touch with the ambassador um, on an uh, almost daily basis uh, since then. And of course the big challenge uh, was whether to issue a travel advisory uh, for um, all the um, Nigerian students and others uh, living in Ukraine uh, to leave. Um, now, you know, an advisory was given uh, that those who uh, felt the need uh, to, to, to leave uh, should do so. Uh, the consensus uh, amongst the uh, diplomatic um, representation of the various countries uh, in Ukraine uh, was that, you know, the citizens uh, should, should stay. Of course, Russia uh, was uh, asserting that um, they were not going to invade, while, of course, the U.S., as we know, and uh, some other Western countries uh, were saying that an invasion was imminent. So it was difficult uh, to know who to really uh, believe. The Ukrainian government was assuring the citizens there that they should just go about their normal business. And some Nigerian students who were interviewed, uh, you know, said that, um, you know, to all intents and purposes, they were totally oblivious and unaware of, uh, of any crisis. And it was just, you know, when they turned on the news or whatever that they heard uh, that there might be some, that there are some issues. So, um, you know, um, so the, 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 the advice from our, from our mission uh, was, you know, not to panic. But importantly, uh, a hotline was set up by the embassy uh, and um, reaching out to all the Nigerians and um, you know, letting them know the number which they can uh, call uh, if um, they were in any kind of uh, uh, trouble. Now, of course, the attack, uh, military action, uh, is underway. I've been in touch with the ambassador uh, today. Uh, he's um, you know, reassured me of um, the safety of the Nigerians uh, uh, in the Ukraine, and, um, and, and, and very importantly, that um, so far, uh, all the attacks um, have been against military installations uh, you know, in the Ukraine. So, um, so that's the situation as of now. But of course, the airports are closed. And um, so um, I've told him that uh, we should, there are five um, uh, airports, uh, <clears throat> inform the Nigerians who are still in the Ukraine that um, once the, um, the, the, the airports are op uh, reopened, uh, that um, arrange uh, in an organized fashion for those who, um, you know, uh, feel that they want to leave, uh, to go to the nearest airports to them, and uh, we will see uh, then how we can assist uh, to, for them to, um, uh, to, possibly, uh, to leave uh, the country. Well, some are going by land, uh, into crossing into Poland and uh, you know, some of these countries. Um, you know, our advice from the embassy is to stay calm, stay in their, in their, in their residence, and um, once there is an opportunity uh, of the airport opening up, um, you know, we'll have a coordinated uh, approach uh, to getting them out. You know, so all the resources available to, to the embassy will be directed towards an orderly um, you know, a process of, uh, of evacuating those uh, who, want to, um, who want to leave. We, we have good relations with Russia. 
uh, we have good relations with uh, Ukraine uh, as well, uh, which is why we are urging uh, for diplomacy. And of course, we have good relations uh, uh, with the US. Uh, we're members of the United Nations and would, um, you know, as, you know, this matter will almost certainly come up. Uh, within the, uh, the United Nations, um, and, and our position uh, would always be um, to avoid uh, violence and military conflict uh, and to prioritize uh, under all circumstances, um, you know, peaceful resolution uh, of, uh, of disputes and uh, prioritizing dialogue and, uh, and diplomacy. In part two of the break, our discussion on the implications of today's invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. And our guest is Nigeria's ambassador to Russia and Belarus, Professor Abdullah Hishehu. That's in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. House of Representatives asks federal government to evacuate Nigerians living in Ukraine as Russia attacks the territory. President Mohamedou Buhari identifies power supply as key ingredient of national economic development as he inaugurates projects in Nasarawa State. Former head of state General Yakubu Gawan seeks quality leadership in political offices as a way of eradicating poverty. And Russian forces enter the north, south and east of Ukraine as the EU says Vladimir Putin has brought war back to Europe. Let's discuss the implication of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm now being joined on the news at 10 by Nigeria's ambassador to Russia and Belarus, Professor Abdullah Hishehu. Thanks a lot for joining us on the news at 10. Thank you very much. It's yeah, a I have to be Indeed, our hearts do go out to the families and, and all those affected in Ukraine at this time. But watching this from where you are in Moscow, what are your immediate thoughts about this invasion going ahead in spite of diplomatic efforts to stop it? It's unfortunate that we have this situation on our hands, uh, which should have been avoided ordinarily. And as the uh, chairperson of the European Commission, uh, Ursula van der Leyen said during the background information uh, there are many people in Russia who are not in support of war and, and nobody would want war anyway. Uh, but um, we now have this situation uh, on our hands. Um, we, we, we need to understand that uh, there, there are certain um, basic things that should have been done which were not done probably that may have led to this. A lot of diplomatic efforts went into, uh, went into this negotiation. Several heads of state consulted and they consulted also with President Putin. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is where we are. Um, but I cannot describe the current situation as the end of diplomacy. Rather, I will say uh, that is politics or diplomacy by other means. And we hope that uh, the, it will not uh, go beyond this. So the diplomatic channels are still open. Uh, the issues are also open. The parties are still disposable to, to, uh, to discussions. And we hope that wisdom will prevail at the end so we can uh, hold the already started situation. Uh, All right, Prof. What are you hearing as regards the well-being of Nigerians in Ukraine? I know the Foreign Affairs Minister has said he's been assured of their safety. You're in Moscow. What are you hearing about their, their well-being right now? The ambassador in Ukraine is in a better position to give that. But uh, this morning, uh, a student from Belgorod woke me up to alert me about the uh, uh, situation uh, on the border between Russia and Ukraine. And I asked him to explain to me what was happening. He said, 
they were hearing gunshots and fire flying over their houses, and they were not in a position to sleep. So I calmed him down and uh, appealed to him uh, to, to take precaution, necessary precaution. And um, as soon as I got to the office, I made contact with the leaders of the Nigerian community in the three major cities on the border with uh, Ukraine, Belgorod, Voronezh, uh, and Rosnov, including Krasneda. I made contact with Nigerians to find out how they are doing, and generally, um, they, they said they are calm, and uh, nevertheless, we are observing and monitoring the situation as it unfolds. Now, now, we saw pictures there of, of many people, hundreds, trying to leave uh, the country as we speak. The UN estimating there that uh, more than 100,000 people um, have left their homes, with thousands trying to cross into Romania and Moldova. Are you getting any requests from Nigerians who want to come into Russia? What's it like for you? Do you are you getting those requests? No, not yet, as at now, but as the Honourable Minister said, um, we have very good relations with Russia, and I believe that when there is need uh, for our citizens to uh, be harbored in, in the Russian Federation, I believe that uh, there will be that possibility. But in the meantime, no request has been made. And we have not issued an official advisory yet because we feel that um, we need to assess this situation uh, within the next one or two days to be able to have uh, an objective assessment of the reality on the ground uh, since no firing has been had within the Russian territory yet. We cannot say that uh, we have a, a, a very direct uh, threat for the time being. Okay, Prof, could you um, just reduce the, the audio of, of your set there just so we can hear you a little bit clearly. There's a little bit of a howl back if you, if you notice. So I'll give you a second while, while you do that. Uh, and while you do that, just to ask again, I know the Minister of Foreign Affairs was talking about evacuation flights, hopefully when the airports open again. But we do hear that special needs children are being evacuated by train. Um, how quickly do you think and realistically would you say the evacuation of Nigerians can begin? Well, as the minister indicated, uh, you know, the, the airports in Ukraine are closed now. Uh, some airports within the Russian Federation at the border with uh, Ukraine are very close. But as soon as the airports are, are open, uh, I believe that those who want to be evacuated uh, will be assisted by the Nigerian missions, both in Ukraine and uh, in Moscow. However, um, we need to be careful also to assess the implications of evacuation. Uh, I have had a lot of sensational reports uh, in the media, especially some Nigerians who have not become sick, they would like to take advantage of this, which is okay. If they want to go, the opportunity will come where the missions will assist them and they will be evacuated safely out of the uh, troubled areas. All right, Nigeria's ambassador to Russia and Belarus, Professor Abdullahi Shehu, thanks for sharing your thoughts on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. We'll have more on the situation in Ukraine a bit later on. But let's cross over to Abuja now. Here's Makwe Ogun Yusuf. Makwe. Hello, Ijeoma. It's good to see you. We start here in neighboring Nasarawa state, where the president has inaugurated the Lafia Cargo Airport and other projects in the state. The airport project, which was conceptualized in 2015 by the past administration in the state, is a 10 billion naira public-private partnership initiative to improve the economy of the north central state. Also inaugurated by President Mohamedou Buhari is a transmission power substation in Akruba. The Nigeria Air Force flight tide conveying President Mohamedou Buhari touches down the Lafia Airport. The president is in the Nasarawa state capital to commission some federal and state projects. And his first port of call is the Lafia Cargo Airport, 
a public-private partnership project that was conceptualized in 2015. From the airport, the president proceeds to the transmission power substation in Akaba to inaugurate the project. He highlights the importance of the project to national development. Whatever we do for power and the railway and roads we are doing, to make sure that we make Nigerians independent so that they mind their own businesses. <laughs> Among the national integrated power projects, the station connects the state to the national grid. This is the president's first visit to the state since the assumption of office of Governor Abdullahi Sule. The president also commissioned other state projects, the Lafia Bus Terminal and the Shinge Kilama Road. Well, over here in the nation's capital, former head of state, General Yakubo Gowan, says the current challenges in Nigeria have made it necessary for a kind of leadership that will make Nigeria's democracy work. He was speaking at the public presentation of the book, Unfinished Greatness, Envisioning a New Nigeria, written by the chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum, Governor Kayode Fayemi of Ikiti State. Also at the event, speakers, including the Chief of Staff to the President, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, reiterated the need for collective efforts in transforming Nigeria into a great nation. Our correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. Convener, Nigeria prays. Eminent personalities, including former Head of State General Yakubu Gowon, the Chief of Staff to the President, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, former Senate President Ken Inamani, present and past governors, lawmakers, politicians, ministers, captains of industries and friends, as well as family members are gathered in this hall to witness the public presentation of the book on finished greatness and vision in a new Nigeria, authored by Governor Kayode Fayemi of Ikito State, who is also the chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum. To welcome the very distinguished chairman of this occasion. The former head of state, General Gowon, and the representative of President Mahmoud Buhari set the ball rolling for the conversation, advocating for quality leadership. We speak of leadership that is concerned with making democracy work in a manner that makes citizens to truly enjoy its dividends. It's Mr. President's view that the more people of experience, people of vision, right, about the future of a society, the better will be for that society. The keynote speaker, Professor Adebayo Olukoshi, also converses for strong institutions and transformational leadership in the making of a nation. Leaders and institutions constitute a dialectic, two sides of the same coin, in which the one helps in the process of evolving the rules of the game and the framework within which policy is developed and evaluated, and the other helps to hold the leader accountable. He believes dignity is important and that African countries like Nigeria must look inward rather than depend on the kindness of foreign countries. The whole idea of shame and the whole idea of self-respect which we practice at home and within our communities are things which we need to graduate to a national level. The book makes a compelling argument for the need to restructure Nigeria and for decentralization and devolution predicated on an honest national dialogue. After speeches are made, the unveiling of the book follows. I'd like to call on the Honorable The author, Governor Kayode Fayemi, speaks on his motivation for writing the book. Despite the difficulties we face as a country, the Nigerian idea and ideal remains strong and indestructible. 
And that is really the essence of what I have devoted a good part of my life and career to. The foreword of the book was written by former head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar. It has 10 chapters and 178 pages. Emperor Simon, Channels, Television News. To security matters, simultaneous bombing of all bandits in state affected will significantly wipe out banditry and terrorism in the Northwest. This is according to Governor Nasir El Rufai of Kaduna State, who spoke at the weekly ministerial briefing at the State House in Abuja. He states that the fear of being dragged before the International Court of Justice has prevented the military from engaging the bandits and permanently wiping them out. Our State House correspondent Gloria Umezioki reports. The governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai, makes the 39th guest at the ministerial weekly briefing in the State House. The prevailing challenge of insecurity came to the fore soon enough as the governor recommends simultaneous bombing of their camps. If we have the Air Force <clears throat> bombing the, the camps, we know, the, we know where the camps are. We have the maps. We know everything. We have their phone numbers. We listen to their conversations uh, sometimes. So, but it has to be done across the five states and the and Niger state at the same time and just wipe them out once and for all. Of course, that has risks because some of the camps may also contain innocent people that have been kidnapped. But this is war. But I'm happy that, you know, by the ruling of the federal high court, they have now been declared terrorists, so they are fair game. Because the military were afraid of bombing them and then facing ICC. He reports that 937 persons were killed and 1,972 kidnapped by bandits in 2020. A total of 1,192 killed in 2021, while 3,348 were kidnapped. For him, the multi-millionaire banditry business is deeply concerning. Because the amount of money these bandits are making is enough to destabilize this country. We hear for, from the uh, um, legal intercepts of the conversations, you know, about how much money they are asking for, how much they have received, and so on. And the, 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 the numbers are mind-boggling. It's a major source of national insecurity. Tackling insecurity for better development for the governor also requires quality education. We are now assessing the secondary school teachers because we took our eyes off that and we've just found out that there are primary school holders certificate holders teaching in secondary schools now we have to get rid of some teachers in secondary schools as well but we have hired about 7700 secondary school teachers they are just standing by for us to ease these ones out in a no-holds-barred session, Governor Nasir disclosed that he has zero ambitions for the office of the president, nor the vice. Why push my luck and go for a job with a 90% chance of failure? And the discussion we are having is that the presidency is zoned to the south. What President Buhari tells me, this is the one I want to be my successor. That's why I'm going. Have a nice day. A 21 billion naira, that's how much the Kaduna state government has invested towards education in the last seven years alone. And even as the second most indebted state in the country after Lagos is looking to ramp up investment in education, he's also calling on his northwest counterparts for additional financial cooperation in order to tackle insecurity in the region. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuki, Channel Television News. In legal matters, a federal high court sitting in Abuja has ordered the interim forfeiture of a property located at plot 1032 and 1033 cadastral zone in the Garaki area of Abuja, linked to former governor of Imo State, Senator Rochas Okorocha. Justice Emeka Nwite gave the order today while ruling on a motion ex parte brought by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, seeking the forfeiture of the property on the grounds that it was illegally acquired. 
In the ruling, the court directed that the interim forfeiture order be published in national dailies, alerting anyone with interest in the property to show cause why it should not be forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria. Justice Mwite adjourned till April the 13th this year for consideration of the motion for final forfeiture of the property. The EFCC claims that two companies in which Senator Koracha is alleged to have interest received over 200 million naira from the Imo State Government Treasury to develop and improve on the said property. And staying with the judiciary, Justice Inyang Ekwo of the Federal High Court in Abuja has fixed February the 28th to hear the bail application filed by the suspended Deputy Commissioner of Police, Mr. Abakiari. The judge fixed the date after counsel to the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Mr. Mike Kassa, informed the court that the bail application was not served on him. Mr. Kassa added that although the applicant counsel served him with a motion and notice, he was yet to be served with a bail application. However, Mr. Kiari's counsel, Cynthia Ikena, insisted that there was a proof of service to that effect. She prayed the court to confirm the proof of service in the court file. After going through the court file, Justice Equo directed Mr. Kiari's lawyer, Ikenna, to serve Mr. Kassa in open court. And that's all from Abuja. It's back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Mark Bear. Back to Russia's invasion and matters relating to it, U.S. President Joe Biden says he's adding to the list of Russian elites and their family members that are sanctioned. It comes in an address tonight in which he says the Russian invasion of Ukraine betrays the sinister vision of the future of the world, one where nations take what they want by force. He has promised the U.S. will defend NATO allies but will not be engaged in the conflict with Russia in Ukraine. Simon Pusey has more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Russian forces have entered the north, south and east of Ukraine with reports of deaths at military bases and explosions near major cities. It comes as the EU says Vladimir Putin has brought war back to Europe. Apocalyptic scenes that look like they're straight from a Hollywood movie. Footage of dozens of Russian helicopters in Oblast. Shelling has been seen in towns and cities across Ukraine. Russia says they're targeting military and strategic landmarks. Try telling that to residents in this apartment building. It's not known how many people died in this attack. Airports have been particularly targeted. Smoke here rising above a military airfield near Chuguev. Main bridges across the country have also been taken out. World leaders have expressed raw outrage, promising unprecedented sanctions to hit the Kremlin. Peace on our continent has been shattered. We now have war in Europe on a scale and of a, and of a type we thought belonged to history. The president of the European Commission said sanctions would seriously degrade the Russian economy. We will later today present a package of massive and targeted sanctions to European leaders for their approval. We are coordinated closely with our partners and allies, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and Norway, but also, for example, Japan and Australia. Boris Johnson said further massive sanctions would now be placed on Russia and said for democracy across the world, their mission in Ukraine must fail. A vast invasion is underway by land, by sea and by air. And this is not in the infamous phrase, some faraway country of which we know little. We have Ukrainian friends in this country, neighbours, co-workers. Ukraine is a country that for decades has enjoyed freedom and democracy and the right to choose its own destiny. Les événements de cette nuit sont un tournant. The French president, who had tried to broker a peace deal meeting President Putin just days ago, said the conflict would have far-reaching consequences for Europe. While Joe Biden released this statement saying the prayers of the entire world are with the people of Ukraine tonight as they suffer an unprovoked and unjustified attack by Russian military forces. 
In the skies, all airspace has been closed. Not a single plane above the country now under attack from multiple directions. Here's surveillance footage showing military vehicles crossing Crimean border checkpoints. It's not known how many Ukrainian troops have been killed, but Russian equipment has been captured, such as this military helicopter. And these army members from the Motor Rifles Division, fighters little older than children. In Kharkiv, one of the cities to be targeted by shelling, hundreds of people queued around the block to donate blood. Others are fleeing their homeland. Gridlock on this motorway heading out of the capital, Kiev. Others fleeing across the border to Poland. I don't care about my own safety. I just, I care about Ukraine. She has family. And Ukrainians. I'm of Ukrainian heritage and to see this happening to the country is just devastating. I just, I just can't believe someone could be so evil. Protests have been taking place around the world, here in Tokyo. Support freedom, support Ukraine. And hundreds turning out here in Berlin. As if nothing was happening, President Putin held bilateral talks with Pakistan's President Imran Khan. That came hours after he took to Russian TV. He said he had authorized what he called a special military operation in Ukraine's Donbass region and told the Ukrainian military to lay down their weapons and go home. The reason for his invasion? To demilitarize Ukraine and protect Russian-backed separatist areas of the Donbass. President Zelensky of Ukraine then addressed his people, saying Vladimir Putin wants to destroy my country, he wants to destroy our country, everything we have been building, what we live for. And it's ordinary people who will bear the brunt. Innocent civilians caught up in a war far from their making. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Simon. Back here in Nigeria, gunmen earlier today reportedly attacked some commercial banks in Urumi, a northwest local government area of Edo State, causing substantial damage and death. The spokesperson of the Edo State Police Command, Bello Kontong, who confirmed the incident, said the four banks, as well as police divisions in the area, were attacked. He also revealed that two police personnel and five civilians died during the incident, which was carried out simultaneously on different locations. According to him, one of the slain police personnel was a female from the division and the other a male serving with Mopol 6th in Auchi. And the Vice President, Professor Yemio Shibajo, has launched the 30th edition of the federal government's Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Clinic in Meduguri, the Borno State Capital, just as he commissioned four out of over 500 projects executed by the Borno State Governor, Babagana Zulum. At the occasion, Professor Oshibajo applauded the efforts of the Borono State Governor for his quest to restore peace in the state with the assistance of security agencies. On behalf of the President and the Federal Government, we want to again salute His Excellency Governor uh, Professor Babaka Naomara Zulu and his hardworking team for their dedication and commitment to working with the military and the federal government to restore peace and normalcy to Borno State. <laughs> Your bold, courageous actions have been instrumental in restoring confidence to residents and visitors and have enabled business and social activities to resume and flourish in this state. Borno State has been and has always been a famous center of learning, agriculture and commerce from time immemorial. And we must all ensure that we should restore it fully to that enviable status. As is well known, MSME clinics serve as a bridge between the federal government, the state government, and small businesses in each state. It does this by bringing all relevant regulatory agencies whose work impact on the business experience of small businesses together in one place to consult and solve problems over a one or two day period. The idea is similar 
to providing an opportunity for patients to consult doctors in a mobile clinic. For some more business news, here's Anne Waudu. Thank you, Ijoma. Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin with oil. The international oil price benchmark, Brent crude, rose above $100 per barrel today. And that's the first time since 2014 following Russia's military attack on Ukraine. However, the price retreated to $99.95 a barrel this evening. And that's after President US, U.S. President Joe Biden mentioned that there are not current plans to target Russia's energy complex with sanctions. Other commodity market, the price of spot gold also reacted positively to the report of the attack as it jumped to one year up by more than 3% to $1,968 an ounce. A total of 574.66 billion naira. That's the amount shared by three tiers of government by the Federation Accounts Allocation Committee as revenue allocation for the month of January. That amount comprises of 291.4 billion naira distributables to tutory revenue, 178.06 billion naira distributable revenue added tax revenue, and 5.20 billion naira exchange gain and 100 billion naira non-mineral revenue out of the total amount distributed by the fact the federal government received 122.7 billion naira, the state government got 62.2 billion naira, and local councils received 48 billion naira. And some company news now. MTN Nigeria and Mafab Communications Limited have made their full payment of $273.6 million each for the 5G spectrum license, and that's according to the Nigerian Communications Commission, the NCC. The executive vice chairman of the NCC, Umar Dambata, made the official confirmation of the payment status today as the deadline set for the two winners of the spectrum auction expires. The NCC says the MTN also paid an extra $15.9 million for the preferred lot one and 3,600 megahertz in 3.5 spectrum while Mafab Communication settled the lot with about 3,700 to 3,800 megahertz at no extra cost. Let's head to the stock market. Now, investor sentiments turn positive today at the close of trade, following renewed bargain hunting human activities for some blue chip stocks. Let's hear more from Will Ibong. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Equities have made a moderate rebound from yesterday's mild drop. The All Share Index rose by 0.14%, adding 35 billion naira to the market value. Now, sifting through the sea of green, total volume made a turnaround from yesterday, boosted largely by trades in custodian investment PLC, Sterling, and Fidelity Bank. While e transact still remained top on the gainer's chart, its share price rose again by 10% to close at 2 naira 42 kroba, followed closely by Learn Africa and Score Nigeria. Zooming in on the sector, some key indexes did not show great margins. The loss in the consumer goods counter was triggered by the drop in international breweries, flour mills, as well as Dangote sugar. And oil and gas index hit massive gains today, especially with global oil prices crossing $100 per barrel. The first since 2014, its index was up 3.85%, bolstered by Seplet Energies, which closed 7.49% higher in today's trading session. The big surprise here is the banking sector, which declined by 0.27%, despite the gains in four of the tier one banks. With the sell-off showing no signs of letting up and as other major equities around the world are closing in on bare territory, we can only hope that the NGX remains positive. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Willie Bong. It's back to you. And that's Business News. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. It's back to you, Gemma. Banking, so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Anne. Let's take a look at some sports news. Here's Victor Matthias.
Thank you, Ijoma, and welcome to Sports News. The president of the Nigerian Football Federation, Amaju Penik, has described as unfortunate the incident that saw players and officials of the senior women national team, the Super Falcons, delayed for over four hours at the Inamdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, on arrival from Abidjan this morning. The team were delayed owing to COVID-19 protocols, but Mr. Penick says the health officials at the airport should have handled the situation professionally. Meanwhile, Minister of Youth and Sports Development Sunday Dari has strongly condemned the unpleasant treatment of the Super Falcons players on their return to the country. Mr. Dari says a complete account of what happened has been received by his office and the ministry will send it to the National Center for Disease Control and the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria to thoroughly investigate the matter and ensure that the nation's footballers, sportsmen and women are treated fairly and respectfully moving forward. UEFA will move the Champions League final from Russian city St. Petersburg on Friday due to the escalating situation in Ukraine. UEFA President Alexander Seferin has called an extraordinary meeting of the Executive Committee for tomorrow morning and it is expected to agree on moving the final. The showcase match in European club football was set to be held at Zenit St. Peter Petersburg's stadium on May the 28th, an event that would have normally drawn thousands of fans from across the continent. And former heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko has taken to social media to send a message of support after Vladimir Putin ordered Russian troops into Ukraine as part of a full-scale invasion. Klitschko says the world is watching how reckless and deadly imperialism is, not just for Ukraine, but the whole world. Let history be a lesson not to be repeated, he says. In an earlier message on Tuesday, the younger Klitschko said, be sure Ukraine is strong. It has a strong capital, strong cities, and a united people who value above all their independence, sovereignty, and peace in Europe. Its will to exist is infinite. Glory to Ukraine. And that's wrap on Sports News. Thank, thank you for watching. I'm Victor Mathias. It's back to you, Joma. Thanks, Victor. And the main news again. The House of Representatives today asked the federal government to evacuate Nigerians living in Ukraine as Russia launched an attack on the territory. Some lawmakers said that it might be too late as the evacuation ought to have taken place long ago. And also today, Russian forces entered the north, south and east of Ukraine as the European Union said Vladimir Putin has brought war back to Europe. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks a lot for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Munyato. Good night.